This morning, we want to come before the Lord and, you know, to continue in our meditation. Meditation on the book of Joshua. I, you know, even though I wasn't able to join uh, us, uh, but, uh, you know, last Sunday, but I could able to catch at least uh, some part of the uh, in live stream, some part of the message uh, last week. Yeah, and uh, we would really want to thank our pastor Rupert, you know, for sharing the word of God with us. You know, it was in one of the occasions that I was uh, praying uh, with him, uh, you know, uh, that he told me, you know, after the pray- prayers, that he could feel the excitement of God in him, you know, because I was sharing with him, uh, you know, what our, our church is going through in terms of our transition. And, uh, you know, about uh, us learning from the, the book of Joshua. And he, he was so excited. And we, indeed, we want to thank him, you know, for bringing that excitement to us last week. Yeah? Amen? Yes, uh, you know, he was telling us that the God, right, or, who was with Moses was also with Joshua. So likewise, you know, the God who was with, in, with us, from the very beginning, from the very initiation of JMK that was founded by our pastor, our senior pastors, Stephen Francis. You know, the same God is still with us in our journey here in JMK. Amen. And, you know, God is excited because, you know, God will want to do a great work in our midst. So therefore, let us not lose heart Right, want to encourage all of us here in JMK as much as the Lord is leading our pastor, our senior pastor in the US, you know, in developing as we hear about the development, right, of all that is taking place in JMK USA. Likewise, I believe that the Lord is also preparing us even for greater things ahead of us. Amen. Right, praise the Lord. So let us just uh, now bow, uh, bow ourselves for a word of prayer as we commit ourselves, as we commit this time to the Lord. Yes, Father Lord, we thank you. We, if Lord, even as this morning, as we open up your word, as we unfold your word again in the book of Joshua, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the so much, so much that you have revealed to us the Lord that you are bringing us, Lord Father. Yes, Lord, you are unfolding to us, Lord Father, your plan and your purpose that you have for us even for this time and this season that we are in. We thank you and we remember that your word tells us, Lord, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that you say that all Scripture, Lord, is god brief and it is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness. So, Father, we ask of you, Lord, this morning, as we unfold your word, Lord, as we meditate upon your word, this morning we ask the Lord, may the God breathe word of yours, Lord, Father, indeed bring life, Lord, to each and every one of us. Lord, if there are areas that we need to be corrected, Lord Father, we ask the Lord that you will indeed, O God Father, cause our heart to be receptive, Lord, to your correction. Grant, Lord, your Holy Spirit will promise, woe, Lord Father, tuck our heart, Lord Father, to give ears and give our hearts, Lord, even to your word this morning. So, Father, Teach us your ways, O God, Father, so that we may prosper. Yes, in all that we do, Lord, Father, if there are areas that has not been pleasing to you, O Lord, let your word rebuild us this morning, O God, Father, so that, Lord, that we shall be trained up in all righteousness and be pleasing before you, O God, Father. We thank you and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right, chapter 5 of Joshua is about preparation for war. 
You know, uh, one of the uh, closing thoughts of that chapter is that where Joshua encounter with the commander of the Lord's army, right? You know, the book of Joshua chapter 5 is really something that, uh, you know, in, in terms of all that is taught formally in all the military academy, you will not be able to find anything uh, that is, you know, in line, right, uh, that will fit in, right, in, you know, in terms of the preparation for war, uh, the strategy, the, war, the, the game plan or the war plan, right, that uh, you normally get to hear about. It is something that is extraordinary. It is something that we probably, you know, in our normal situation, we will not be able to think that it's going to work out well. But yet, we know that it is because it is the Lord who is leading His people. It is the Lord who is the one who is the commander of the Lord's army who will be the one who will leading them forward, right? That it will be working out well for the people of Israel as they cross over to possess their promised land. Amen? So, you know, if you were to recall, you know, one of the modern day uh, military uh, battle that was fought, uh, you know, uh, that is not short of any uh, miracles is that of the Six Day War that was in, happened in 1967 between Israel and, uh, and with the Arab nations. Yeah, and that was led by, especially by Egypt. You know, uh, when Israel came back together, when the nation of Israel was birthed forth in the year 1947, right in May, when, you know, they, they, it upset the entire nations around. And uh, they were facing a very hostile, hostile uh, uh, no, nations, and that it was in the year... 1967, that Egypt and some of the Arab nations declare war upon Israel, right, to bring about total destruction, you know, of this nation. You know, when, when, when Israel faced with such kind of challenge, with such kind of a danger, definitely, you know, it's normal for them to call out to their allies, right, uh, you know, to the U.S. as well as to Europe to, you know, to come and help them. But what happened? None of them. They were all neutral. None of them wanted to interfere. And it left nothing, no, no more option for Israel but to defend themselves. And, you know, during that time, you know, the whole of the nation was so uh, ter terrified because, you know, they were outnumbered, outnumbered in terms of their military strength, in terms of their military capacity. You know, their, their weapons, their weapons and, and their, you know, their firepower, uh, their air power, their land power, uh, not only are being outnumbered in terms of three or four to one, right? And also they were... Their weapons were also not up to date, you know, compared to those uh, that were owned by the other nations. Uh, the other nations were having more sophisticated weapons, aircraft that, that were able, you know, to easily overpower that of the Israel nation. But yet, you know, it was because of divine intervention. And there were many miracles that happened. And if you were to consult with any of the military academy, they would not be able to come up with any military plan that will provide a way of escape or even a way of overcoming the war. You know, but yet we can see that the outcome was surprising to everybody. It was nothing short of a miracle, 
right? Hallelujah. Indeed, we praise God. And likewise, you know, today as we look into Joshua 5, as we consider what God is doing in the lives of the people. And I believe that it's the same thing today, you know, for the church of God. Right, God is preparing His people. You know, we may not be able to, to see uh, uh, what is God is really working out in our midst, but yet God is preparing us for war ahead. Amen? Now, I'd like to recap with us. You know, we have talked about uh, chapter 1. You know, the Bible tells us that, you know, the book of uh, Joshua, Right, it's really about a uh, victorious living for us, victorious living for us, even in present day. Yes, we, there's much that we can do, that we can learn, and that we can do. And I thank God, I thank God that in, at this time, as we look into the book of Joshua, God is really unfolding for us here in JMK what He has planned for us, the things that He will want us you know, to, to, to take note of and not only to take note of, but also to bring about, you know, to put that into practice in our means. Right? Chapter 1 tells us about, you know, it, God told uh, Joshua when he assigned him, when he appointed him to lead the people, you know, over the, the river Jordan and to possess their promised land. One thing that he told him is that, that Joshua, in order for him, right, to gain good success, right, he will need to do all that is written in the Word of God. So therefore, obedience is the very key to success. We need to recognize that our obedience to God will, is the only key that will bring about success in our Christian living. And not only that, you know, uh, chapter 2 talks about uh, the, the Rahab, you know, that among all the people in that land of the Canaans, right, that she was the only one that feared God and she was the only one was looking forward, you know, to, to, to be part of, you know, of, that ish, of, the, of the family of God and they hear God, hear, hear her cry and God, you know, sent forth a rescue team to come and to rescue her. So when she put her faith into action, it resulted in salvation, not only for her, but also for her family. And chapter 3, we talks about getting ready to cross over, you know, into a new beginning. God is doing a new thing in our midst. And definitely we know that in today, right, God is also doing a new thing in our life. And there is nothing too difficult for Him. Even though the, the Jordan River was at its peak, at its flooding peak, you know, that it's impossible for them to cross. But yet, there is nothing too difficult for God to able to bring them across even through dry land. You know, it is, it is not that when the water was heaped up, was stopped at uh, 20 miles up in the city of Adam, that they slowly dry up. It was an immediate uh, happening. The moment, right, when the priest stepped into the river, you know, it's just like magical. The whole place, the entire river bed, right, turns into dry ground. And so that the Israelite people was able to cross over. It is um, nothing short of a miracle. And, you know, chapter 4 talks about the memorial stone. When they cross over, God told them that specifically to bring with them 12 memorial stones so that they could able to stack it up and that it could be visibly, you know, be seen by anybody and especially you know, to be used as a memorial to, to talk to, you know, to relate to the next generation that is to come. So that all the peoples of the earth will know that God alone is the mighty to save, that God alone is mighty to deliver them, right? And God alone is the one who was with them. 
and will be with them. Right, and today we're going to talk about chapter 5, that is to get ready for war. You know, the, the commander of the army, Jesus himself, will be leading us out into triumphant victory. Now, there are three things that we can learn from this chapter 5. One is that before we can talk about conquest, before we can go out to be able to conquer, we firstly need to consecrate ourselves before the Lord. We need to consecrate ourselves again to come into covenant with Him, you know, to be His people, right? And that is very key and very important. Consecration before conquest. And next is to remember the redemption, redemption of what God has done for us you know, just like the memorial stone, you know, that will be as that that will be um that will bring to remembrance what God has done for us. And indeed, you know, as even as we have the Holy Communion, the Holy Communion is a memorial. It's a memorial of to bring to remembrance what the Lord Jesus Christ has already done for us. That victory has already been attained for us on the cross of, you know, when He was nailed to the cross and when He was rose again from the dead. Victory is already on our side. Amen? And the third thing that we can learn from this chapter is that we need to worship. We need to come into worship. Worship before warfare. There's a need for us to recognize that before we could enter into any warfare, we need to bow ourselves before the living God, you know, to worship of Him. Because when He, when he comes, when He leads us out, it will be a triumphant victory for all of us. Amen? Right. So let us read from Joshua chapter 5, to, from verse 1 to verse 9. It says, as soon as all the kings, right, of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they have crossed over, their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. Israel. What a powerful thing. What a powerful, you know, news that has brought across. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, you know, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeah Haralol, which is in Hebrew, it means that the hill of the four skins. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on their way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they have come out of Egypt, had not been circumcised. For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. The Lord swore to them that He would not let them see the land that the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give to us a land flowing with milk and honey. So it was their children whom is raised up in their place. You know that Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. When circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord says to Joshua, Today, I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. 
And so the name of the place is called Gigal, which is mean roll away to this day. You know, it is so sad to know, you know, that it, God it was the one who has, you know, told the people, you know, when they were being delivered out of Egypt, if they were to obey His commandment, you know, they will be His people and God will be their God. And that God has, as He has promised to Abraham, right, that He will give to His descendants, you know, this land that is flowing with milk and honey. And yet, when the people were being delivered, when the people were given this promise, yet they were in disobedience. They were stiff-necked people. They will not obey the Lord and they will not believe what the Lord says. And because of this, you know, they have to perish. They will not be able to go in even over the Jordan into the promised land. So let us not be like these people. Let us be those that is of the generation that was raised up again, you know, in the wilderness that will obey the Lord you know, that we're able to see and step into our destiny, into our promised land. You know, the first thing that we want to recognize here, you know, even as it was mentioned in, the, in chapter 5, verse 1, is to recognize that, you know, whatever that you are facing today, whatever challenges that you may have, right, know this for sure, that your enemy is already defeated, right? Whether be it the flesh, be it the world, or be it the devil, right? They are already defeated. Even though it may appear to you, right, that things are not working out your way, even though the evidence may be showing, you know, otherwise, but yet we need to know that we are advancing from the point of victory. Amen? Yes, victory has already been attained for us on the cross. So even though the enemy refused to budge, even though they will still continue to stay on and to fight on, but the Bible tells us when we resist the devil, he will have to flee from us. Amen? So therefore, I will encourage all of us, whatever situation that you may be facing today, right, even though it may appear, right, the evidence, like they say, even it may appear to be fearful to you, right, false evidence appearing real to you, right, let it be known to us that indeed that victory has already been attained for you, that victory is awaiting you, and all you need to do is to stand upon the promises of God and to advance and to resist the devil, resist the enemy, and he shall flee from you. Because he, when you come, when you come on sight, when you come into your land, right, he will have to flee. Amen. Praise God. We thank God. Yes, that indeed we can shout victory. Victory, you know, as we cross over into our promised land. Amen. So at the time, the Lord says to Joshua, Make flee knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. You know, why is it that the Lord wanted uh, Joshua to use flee knives? Because flee is a stone which is very hard and it has an antiseptic properties. Uh, it is say that, Bacteria will not grow onto, onto this stone and therefore it can be used, you know, uh, to be used as knife. And when it's broken, it leaves a very sharp edge, right? Not though, even though it may not be as sharp as a sharpened iron uh, sword, but yet it is good enough to be able to be used for circumcision. But the downside is that it will be a painful process. It will be painful and that it will take time to heal. Now, why was it that it is, it is to be done in that way? Because when we have to go through the pain, when we have to bear the pain, we recognize, right, it will be registered in us, right? The, you know, the, 
the cutting away of the flesh signifies, right, resembles the, the removal of our flesh, the removal of our sinful nature. You know, so whenever we, we, we think about the circumcision, whenever, you know, the Israelite people, after they have been circumcised, they, every day they will be remembered, they will recall, you know, uh, that indeed, you know, they are, they have been circumcised people, they belong to the Lord, you know, and it was very painful. And if they were to disobey the Lord, you know, it will be something that will be painful, just like the circumcision that they will have to remove that part of their sinful nature from, from them out of their way. Amen. And who is, is and the reason why the Lord wanted them to be circumcised, because you know, on the 14th day of the month, right? They have just crossed over on the 10th day of the first month. And on the 14th day of the month, they were to observe the Passover meal for the first time, you know, in the promised land, for the first time. You know, the Bible tells us that uh, the Lord, you know, has given the requirement when he spoke to Moses and Aaron in the book of Exodus, you know, what is the, who will be qualified to observe, to partake of the Passover? Uh, it was spoken specifically and it was recorded and written for us that no foreigner shall eat of it, right? But every man servant who is bought for money when you have circumcised, only the person that has been circumcised, right, will be allowed to partake of the Passover, right? And it says that only the congregation of Israel, right? Because why? The congregation of Israel will have gone through the circumcision. And all those, the foreigners in the land, all those who, who are not part of the household of Israel, now if they will choose to want to partake of the Passover, they are allowed to, provided they are being circumcised. Because it is said that no uncircumcised people shall eat of it. No uncircumcised people. So that is the reason why the Lord told Joshua that he will need to perform the circumcision among all the meals in in that in that place in Gigal before they allowed to partake of the Passover. Now, what does circumcision signify? Circumcision is a sign of the covenant with God and His people, because it was in Genesis when God told Abraham, right? Circumcision was to be a covenant sign between God and the children of Abraham. The covenant was to be passed down from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and passed through all the generations of the children of Israel. Uh, it is recorded in, for us in Genesis chapter 17 that this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And in verse 14 it says, And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So it is a very important and a very strong requirement, right? That the people of God, if we were to belong to the, to the family of God, you know, the people of the Israelite people, you know, the children of Abraham, right? They will need to be circumcised before they are being considered to be part of the household of God before they are considered to be God's people. Circumcision represents three things, right? As we say that it signifies an ownership 
that the people belongs, the now belongs to God, the sign that they are His people. It is an outward sign, a physical sign that is marked on them that they belong to God. And as we say, is that the cutting away of the flesh, the circumcision, the re- is a sign of the removal of the sinful nature so that they will be sensitive to the to the sins of the flesh and and that they will be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit like you and I. You know, we are to be circumcised. Uh, Our heart is to be circumcised so that we no longer will be led by our flesh, but to be led by the Spirit of the living God. Right? And not only that, you know, in, in, in so doing, while they were so close, you know, to the fortified city of the enemy. You know, the enemy could easily, because they will be putting themselves into a very vulnerable situation, right? They will not, if, they, if during that period, if they will be circumcised, it will take a couple of days and maybe even weeks before they are being healed and before they could able to fight again to go into war. So if they were to circumcise themselves in that kind of situation where their enemies are surrounding them, you know, they know that they will only be heading towards destruction of their own self. But yet, you know, when they obey the Lord, when they trusted Joshua and followed the instruction, right, it is a demonstration. It is an outward demonstration of their faith in God, of their complete trust in the Lord. Yes, that even though they could not understand, you know, even though that it may seem to be of a high risk to them, but yet they know that they need to obey because it's only then it will, they will be able, you know, to be blessed by the Lord, to be blessed by the Lord. So therefore, the, the three things that is important in this uh, act of circumcision. And is circumcision required for us today? No, the Bible tells us that as Christians, we do not need to be circumcised. We do not need to place our confidence in the flesh, right, in the works of the flesh. Because the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 3 that for we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, when we receive the Lord Jesus, when we have the Holy Spirit in us, we are the circumcision. We rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. We are not to place our confidence in our flesh. And also in Colossians chapter 2, it tells us that in Him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead. So therefore, the moment when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we... uh, you know, allow ourselves, our sinful nature to be buried together with Him, right? And to be rose, risen again with Him, with a new body, with a new life, right? With a new, given a new life, a new creation. You know, we know that we are circumcised in Him. Amen? We do not have to go through the act of the physical circumcision. Before God, you and I are circumcised in our hearts. You know, it is important to note that Abraham, right, wasn't accounted righteous before the Lord because of circumcision, but because he believed. It was the only qualification that he was accounted to be righteous. Abraham received the circumcision as a personal seal of the righteousness of faith that he had. It was only after when he trusted the Lord, when he believed God for what he says, that that very act of circumcision was 
an outward uh, uh, act was an outward sign of his personal faith. How then was it accounted in Romans chapter 4? It says, while he was circumcised or uncircumcised, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Amen. We praise God. Yes, we thank God for His word, for His promise, that we do not need to be circumcised, but as we put our faith in Him, just like Abraham did, we know that we have been imputed with His righteousness. But even though we do not have to go through the act of physical circumcision, we are to be people that are to be circumcised in our heart and we are to be people that need to be committed and to set our priorities right with Him. And even today, right, we want to encourage all of us, you know, especially in this time, you know, we, we need to recognize that God, just like He was preparing the people, right, at the time to prepare them for war, God in this time and season is also, is also preparing us for war. We need to recognize that because there are signs, you know, of days that, of trouble that will be coming, right? We need to be found committed in Him. Just like, you know, the Israelite people, before they can go to war, they need to come back to the Lord. They need to once again, you know, uh, have their covenant with the Lord again and go through the circumcision. Therefore, we need to be committed to follow the Lord closely, right? Presenting ourselves as living sacrifice on a daily basis. A circumcision of the heart and that is a daily requirement. Set our priorities, not let the pressing things creep in and rob us from our priorities with Him. So today, I'd like to encourage us, right, to tell the Lord, tell the Lord, tell Him, today, Lord Jesus, I'm presenting myself to you as a living sacrifice. Let us tell Him every day, you know, that we come before Him to present ourselves as His living sacrifice, that, you know, we are presenting ourselves to Him as His servant. We will want to obey Him and we will want to follow Him. We want to do whatever He asks of us, no matter how hard or how difficult or how challenging it may be. Right? We do not want to belong to, you know, to ourselves, but we want to belong to Him. Right? Because if we were to follow our sinful nature, our selfish nature, it will not result in any good. But when we follow Him, we know, as the Bible tells us, that we will have good success. You know, you have, we will want to tell Him that you have bought, He is the one who has bought us with His precious blood, and that He and He alone is the Lord and the King of our life. So therefore, today, right, tell the Lord that you will want to read His Word, that you will want to devote yourself to prayer, that you want to love your family and God's family too, right? And not only really that, whoever that God that brings into your path, right, that you are to demonstrate God's love to them. And that today, that you will take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And that today, you will rejoice about everything and not be grumbling about anything, about nothing that today you will sanctify yourself before the Lord and today that the Lord will guard, you know, yourself against the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Right? We know that we will not be able to do this in our own strength. Therefore, we want to ask the Lord to give us the strength 
that we need so that we are able to see through this commitment, right? To ask of Him, you know, to, 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 to come in the power of His Holy Spirit, to baptize us in the power of His Holy Spirit, so that as we trust Him, He will surely bless us with every spiritual blessing, right? And that, that you know, we will need the wisdom that, that comes from Him, that comes from above, that we could able to live our life for Him. Yes, we know that we lack wisdom and we need Him to bless us richly, overflowing, just like even more than what He gave to Solomon, right? So that we may able to live our life that would glorify Him. So let us make that commitment today, right? To present ourselves as daily sacrifice acceptable unto the Lord, right? And not only that, you know, in so doing, right, it pleases the Lord. It pleases the Lord when the people obey, obey Joshua to follow the instruction from Joshua. And, it, and in chapter 5, verse 9, the Lord says to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gigal to this day, which means rolling away. And God is rolling away, taking something off of them that always want to do that he and that He will want to do the same for you and I. You know, the moment when we we recognize that you know God, even as He prepared to bring the people over the Jordan River, you find that God was doing, doing everything, you know, to remove all that is a hindrance, you know, from their people, so that when they cross over, when they possess the land, they will be free of every encumbrances. They will be free of everything that is holding them back in order to possess their destiny and to possess the promised land. So what could it be, that the reproach that is spoken about here? Uh, it could be that, you know, in that 400 years, then they were serving as slaves in Egypt. You know, they had been mocked at, you know, they had been tagged with the name of being called a slave, right? Or it could have been in that 40 years of wilderness wandering, you know, it has been a reproach to the people of Israel. Or it could have been the influence of the Egyptians when they were in the land of Egypt. You know, the, the Egyptians, you know, when, when God, you know, sent Moses to deliver his people, to free them even from uh, Pharaoh's, to let his people go. But yet, Pharaoh refuses the stubbornness and the disobedience you know, that was demonstrated must have an influence over the life of the Israelite people when they were in the land. So this could have been a reproach to them, right? But however, as we look at this verse, this verse has to do with the context of circumcision. For the Israelite, it was a token of their relationship to God. Without it, no Israelite would not be able to partake of the Passover. So therefore, we recognize that the reproach that God has removed from them in the midst is the very fact that they, now that they having been circumcised, now they are the very sons and daughters of God. They now belong to God. You know, while they were traveling, wandering in the wilderness, you know, it was told to us that God has rejected that generation, that generation that refused, you know, to want to believe that God has prepared a wonderful land for them, that generation that has been stiff-necked and has been grumbling in the wilderness. God has rejected them to, you know, to be their own people, to be His own people. But here, you know, be, be, even before they partake, of the Passover, and even as they partake of the Passover, they have been restored back. They have been given the rights 
again to be the sons and daughters of the living God. So we thank God. We thank God that today, you know, the Bible tells us that, you know, before, you know, we became Christian, you know, we, we are without God. We are without, you know, any hope. But the moment when we receive Him, right, He has brought us into His family. He has given us the right to become sons and daughters of the living God. He has removed the reproach away from us. And now we are able to enjoy you know, all the blessing that He has installed up for us. Amen. We praise God. You know, the celebration of the Passover the, in, the, in, in that promised land is about coming back into His presence. Right? All these things that is coming, right? it comes down to one thing, all that they were doing, the circumcision and the observing of the Passover, just as we observe the Holy Communion, it comes down to one thing, uh, that is to carry the presence of God. Right? And not only that, this is also meant to do one thing, is that, that we might experience the presence of God in our life. And also that in our Christian walk, it is coming into the presence of God. So before we can go into war, God wants to bring us back right to the very central thing that is to come into His presence, to come and to celebrate and to remember the Lamb of God that was sacrificed for us on the cross that we may be able to be called the sons and daughters of the living God. So it is for this very purpose that God is once again, you know, even in these past four months, even in this COVID situation, you know, we were known, we were told that, you know, we, it, is, it is once again, you know, we have this Passover, right? Or this Easter that we have celebrated, you know, just like what was done, that we were once again brought back into the awareness of what God has done for His people in our celebrating it in our own household. Now, the next thing that we can learn is the final thing is that you know, God revealed Himself as the commander of the Lord's army before even Joshua and the people were to move into battle order to take over, you know, the city of Jericho. Now, in chapter 5, verse 13, it tells us that it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, Joshua was probably going out to survey the place, the city that is known to be impenetrable because of its walls, you know. Yeah, that, that even as he was going out there, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or are for our adversaries? Are you for us or for... You know, Joshua was acting like any sentry. There is sentry that was on duty. You know, when you see someone that is approaching you, someone that is not, you know, that you could not recognize as part of the, you know, of your own armed forces, Right, you are supposed to challenge the person whether he is a foe or a friend. Yeah, and so Joshua likewise issued the challenge to this man that he saw with his sword. You know that is is that is out. He doesn't know if this person is from Jericho or was he from the surrounding Amorites or someone from outside the land or who is for them. And that he noticed that man already have his sword drawn. That means to say that this person is all ready to go into action, right? And Joshua, the warrior that he is, he's the man that goes to 
with his sword and to issue the challenge. He was not afraid even if he would have to die, you know, but Joshua was ready to fight at the moment. So it gives us a picture of the greater Joshua that we know of, of Jesus. Our Jesus is ready for fight for us, you know, is ready to fight for us just like Joshua. When, and when he encountered with this man, with his sword that is drawn out, he was ready to engage in a fight with this person. Jesus is always ready to engage the fight for you and I. So let us not be discouraged in whatever situation we may be at this point in time. For some of us, we know that we may be going through a challenging time. For some of us, we, you know, it seems like the days ahead may be uncertain. But know this one thing that the Lord Jesus is with you and that He will not leave you alone, that He will be fighting for you and with you. So Jesus is the captain of the Lord's army. And not only that, He is the captain of our salvation. Right? Jesus fought for the battle of Jericho. You know, it was, though in coming in this way, Jesus says that, no, neither. You know, he was he was telling he was telling Joshua that he, you know, he said that no, but as in 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 uh, ESB version it says, as I am, you know, the word I am, I am the commander of the army of the Lord. I have now come, and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worship and say to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And Joshua, then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. So you recognize that the moment when, Jesus, when the commander of the army right, say that no, he is neither of this, you know, whether he is come, whether he is a foe or friend, he is telling Joshua, Joshua, I am the commander of the Lord's army. Joshua, I'm the one that is actually going into war, right? I have my sword drawn out. I'm the one that is going to fight on your behalf and, you know, and not you alone. So therefore, let us recognize, right, that it is the Lord who is the one that is fighting for the Israelite, for the people of Israel, even as they go into war. So that's why you see that, you know, the, the plan that they have for them, you know, the war plan that was placed before them is something that they could not think of. It's something that is... You no, know, the logical mind will not be able to accept because it is from the divine plan of God. Amen? Yes. So, what does this have to do with us today? We need to recognize that war is inevitable, right? It was told to us even in Matthew 24 that Jesus was telling about the end time, about the end that is to come, right? And it says in Matthew 24, it says that, And you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. So therefore, we need to, we need to be aware that indeed, as what the Lord Jesus says, that we will in the days ahead, we will be hearing about wars and rumors of war. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And these are but the beginning of the birth, birth pains. You know, we need to recognize that war is inevitable. We will be heading towards war. And our warfare is not fought with 
mere human weapons. It is a pulling down of strongholds. The future of the war of the church is that of the clash of the kingdoms. I like to relate to you, uh, you know, a vision that was recorded in this book called The Future War of the Church. It is a book by Chuck Pierce, the prophet Chuck Pierce. I think a number of you may know, you know, before he was called into, you know, into his ministry, the Lord reveals to him in the vision. You know, in the vision, he saw there was this structure, this governmental structure, this building. There was a big building, right, uh, that is about 50 or stories high. And, and, you know, and in that building, it appears, it says that uh, it was a large building. Each room was, was brightly lit and the structure were well built although the building was also flexible at that time. However, as I watched, the building became more and more rigid and unchangeable. As it grew rigid, the lights grew dim. Even though there was still some light emanating from the rooms, the structure began to look more like a prison than a flexible organism of change. And God says, I will have an opportune time when many will come out of this church government and begin to flow into another government structure that will arise. In other words, that building that, you know, that Chuck Pierce saw represents that of the church organizational structure, the church governmental structure as we know of it today. But the other building that he saw, you know, he saw that there was another building that was being constructed rapidly and was of great strength. He saw there were rooms that were represented a uh, religious system from nations around the world. From nations around the world. Uh, these are a religious system that God has shown him you know, that has a great influence on the earth in the days ahead. And, and this religious system is coming into confrontation. You know, I'm not talking of, he says that uh, it is controlled by, you know, satanic principalities and power. Uh, he saw that there were, you know, militant, 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 uh, that is gaining control of territories, you know, that establish the authority through war, through bloodshed, or whatever else may be necessary to maintain and secure the, uh, the ground that they gain. So even as we've seen uh, in the news of what is happening right around the world, you know, of some of these uh, terrorist acts, or some of this uh, burning down and tearing down, right, of the, that is happening in, in some places in the world. Uh, it is, uh, you know, represented, representing this vision uh, that, that uh, Chuck Pierce saw in the second building. It is a building of lawlessness that was actually, you know, connected in the form of the administration to religious systems located in this building. And it was said, it was shown to him that the foundation of this building, right, was made of mammon. He has his foundation built upon mammon, upon Jezebel, upon Ahab, upon Babylon. But God showed him a third picture, which is a third building. He says that there was a building that was filled with light. The Lord called it my future kingdom authority. This building was very small. It just beginning to form and was still lacking in size and shape. That even so, the structure was nothing but light and glory. And several words appeared on its foundation. 
And these were the five ascension gifts listed in Ephesians 4.11 that make up the government of God, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And God was bringing order to these five gifts and placing them in foundation. Every time one gift will be set in order, the light would increase tremendously. And I saw many leaders from the first building right, move their office from the old building into this new structure. As they turn out the lights of their office in the old structure, that building grew dark and much more rigid and it was unable to withstand you know, the lawlessness that was taking place in the land. However, the Lord's new structure began to rise and it has the ability to superimpose itself over the structure of lawlessness and to overcome their government. So I like to you know, encourage us that indeed as what it was revealed to us, you know, there will be change in the structure. There will be the clash of the kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light that were going to take place. And therefore, you and I must prepare ourselves for the war that is to come, right? Though that this may be wonderful time, but it is also a dangerous time ahead. The church is maturing, right? The church, but it has not yet mature, fully mature. You know, even as the people, the Israelite people, as they step in the promised land, you know, the, the supply of the manna ceases the moment they add from the supply, the, pro, the produce of the land. So it's the sign of them, you know, uh, being able to be on their own be able, right, to, to reap the, the, you know, from the produce of the land. So it is a sign of them maturing. The church is, is a crisis of competition for harvest with other organized religious forces. Confrontation with dark forces behind the opposing belief system will be the norm for the future. God is calling us to gear up for warfare which we are about to enter, right? What do we need to do? We need to think prophetically, right? Because the Bible tells us that in Proverbs 29, no clear prophetic vision, the people will quickly wander astray. There will be the shifting of the season in, from one to another. Even as we saw that, you know, even during the time of John the Baptist, he was between the old and the new. You know, John was the one who came to prepare the way of the Lord. He was the one who came during that time, you know, prophesying about the kingdom of God that is at hand and that calling the people to repent. But however, when he was in prison and then when he saw there was something that was new that was taking place, something that he could not recognize. John sent his disciples to ask, to inquire about, and he asked Jesus, you know, are you the one coming or do we have to look for another? John the Baptist, even though he was called to prepare the way of the Lord for the new time and the new season, but yet he could not recognize the change of the new structure. You no, know, Jesus had to tell his disciples, go back and tell this to John. He says the blind receive their sight and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And the blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So, so, you know, John could not recognize, but, you know, you and I will need to be able to have our mind tuned, you know, to the time and the season 
or where God is bringing us into, right? They will be able to recognize what is doing, what God is doing in our midst. We need to stay alert to the activity and the unusual things that may be happening around us, just like what we are going through even in this time, you know, of the COVID situation. The whole world is changing. The way of doing business is changing, right? And the way of us living our life, right, is going into a new normal. The watchmen, the key to this hour is that we need to have the watchmen, right, to be able to be in place. The watchmen to be able to see, right, you know, to be able to warn the people of what is to come and to ask the Lord to build a strong defense for us so that we will always be on the offensive and on guard that the God has given us to, to guard over what He has given to us. And we are to keep our spirit alive, right? To be active so that we can discern accurately. You see, in this time, you know, as we feel it in our spirit, that the enemy tactic is to wear the saints down and to keep us to be in a state of apathy or passivity, right? It was said in Daniel chapter 7, He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, you know, and shall think to change the times and the law. In fact, the law has been changed, right? You know, has been put in place that, you know, of how we're going to live our life, right? Not in the usual way as we used to be. Uh, if we were to remain as lukewarm, we will not have the energy or the passion to move into the best that God has reserved for us. So our discernment is key to defeating the apathy and to remain on the offensive. Right, we are to keep in touch with each other regularly, you know, connecting ourselves in relationship to one another so that we are able to secure our future together. God has sovereignly put us together to align us to one another so that we can function together effectively as a body of Christ. Know with whom God has connected, connected us with. Do not neglect the gathering together. God will speak and reveal things we may not see on our individual basis, but collectively, as we come together, God is able to reveal to us the things that He would want us to lead us into. So do not let petty issues or offenses distract us. You know, religious spirit works counter to get us focused on you know, legalistic rules and regulation to the extent we may miss the overall picture of what God is doing. Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets, and He did this through, the, through love and through the cross. Therefore, faith, our faith, must be accompanied by works of love, and our faith must be able to overcome every offenses that may comes our way. Stay focused on the harvest rather than pinpointing how someone is doing it wrongly. You know, in fact, um, I was so encouraged recently when I was just chatting with our, you know, our brother Mango. You know, he was sharing with me because during this period, uh, he, he, was, he also lost his job and he's waiting for his next uh, job assignment uh, that will come about in the month in this month and uh, during this time when he was staying at home you know there were some of these young teenager that came knocking on his door and these were young christian these are young christian and one of them is a medical student right they come around knocking on the door even though in this covid situation even though it may seemingly seems to be of you know of a challenge of a risk, but yet you know this young Christian, you know they were so passionate about their faith, 
right? To want to spread the good news, to want to share the gospel, right? In whatever way possible. And they went knocking on the doors of the people. And, you know, it, it just goes to show, you know, how much you and I are ready to prepare to do, right? We have been Christian for many years, but yet these people, you know, they are young Christian, but yet they are willing to pay the price, you know, to bring the good news, to bring the gospel to others in this time, you know, because the good news will bring hope to those who are without hope. Amen? So uh, let us not lose sight of what we are called to do. So therefore, today, even as we have considered the Word of God, let us prepare ourselves, you know, for war in the days to come. Let us consecrate ourselves, you know, let us come into worshipping the Lord and committing ourselves to Him so that He will be the captain, He will be the commander that will lead us out, you know, from victory unto victory. Amen. Praise the Lord. We thank the Lord for what He has revealed to us in His Word today. And we give thanks to Him. Shall we bow for a word of prayer? Our oh, Father, we want to thank You. We want to thank You that Lord God, Father, that You are doing a work in our midst. Lord, You are unfolding to us Your purpose, Your plan, and Your calling for us even here in JMK. And Lord, Father, we thank You that, Lord, that indeed You have a calling for us here. We thank You that, Lord, that You are the one who has brought us together, Lord, as Your body. You are the one who has brought us together to be connected to one another. And You are the one who has called us for a purpose, for a time as such. So, Father, even as we commit ourselves to You, even as we avail ourselves to You, even, Lord, as we consecrate ourselves again back to You, Lord Father, to one, Lord Father, to tell You, Lord Father, that we belong to You, that we no longer belong to ourselves. Lord, that we live our life, Lord Father, in, in following You, in pleasing You. So, Lord, we ask that, Lord, may You lead us, lead us in the days ahead, Lead us from victory unto victory. The Lord, that glory and honor and praise will go to your name. The Lord, that many, many will be brought into your kingdom, O oh God, Father. So Lord, we give thanks to you and we give praise to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.